Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate you to the next level in your life. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. I can picture myself overcoming, but without pressure. I can picture myself doing everything that God has called me to do, but without any trials. You know what that's called? Wishful thinking. No, if God has called us to invade and you're part of this church, it just means that you're an overcomer. That means that no matter what comes your way this year, you overcome, you win. That means that you remind yourself this is fixed. And I am, I am overcoming. I'm going to advance the kingdom of God. Your family this year have people. I, we still have the names of the people that will come. We're believing they will be saved. But by July, June, we all forget those people because they're still getting on our nerves. They're still rejecting us. They still don't want to come, no matter how many times we call them. No, we don't quit. We don't surrender. We become annoying. Be annoying for the kingdom of God. Remember before you were annoying, and that was without Jesus. (laughs) Now you have a license to annoy them in love. Not to tell them like, oh, see, you're going through this because that. No, I know them with the love of Jesus. After all, the Bible says that his love covers a multitude of sins, right? Okay, let me give you um, uh, the first scripture, Matthew 11 to 12. Every scripture that I'm going to give you is my favorite scripture. So if you come every Wednesday, I always tell you that. So, which means the word of God is my favorite scripture every time. Matthew 11, 12 says this, for the days from, from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heavens has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. Another uh, translation says this, from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the forceful people lay hold of it. The forceful people lay hold of it. If you have a promise that God has given you, you need to start being forceful. You can't wait to just come and, you know, like you're believing for healing and you just want someone to uh, lay hands on you and voila, you're healed. Yes, we have those instant healings because God does miracles. But let's say someone lay hands on you, but it hasn't happened. But God gave you a promise that you shall be healed. And if you'd said, well, no, God never spoken to me, then that's when you go back to the word of God and it says that he died for us, not only for our sins, but he's carrying every sickness and disease on the cross. So that's a promise. And it says that the violent, the forceful, the valiant, I want to be known as a valiant woman. I want this church to be known as a valiant, that we don't stop until we see the promises of God come to pass in our lives. I want to see marriages heal. I want to see people restore. I want to see healings take place in this life. I want to see everything that God calls us to do. I want to see it. I want to see the school already done. I want to see the orphanage that I already see. I want to see all these things that are already in my heart, in our heart as a church that God is calling us to do. I want to see it. I want to see revival. But see, we will never see it unless we, we do it by ourselves. Oh, it starts within ourselves. There is no way I can bring revival if I'm not even revived myself. We're waiting for revival. We're waiting for all these things. We're waiting for the kingdom of God to be ad- advancing. But I want to be at the end of the line. My husband always says, this, this church is not a Disney cruise. And I was like, why not? <laughs> I always wanted to go on a cruise because I hear you eat a lot. <laughs> so I was like, what? And it's inclusive? You can eat all you want? And then they're like, somebody was painting that picture. You go and there's like 27 restaurants and you could eat seafood and you could eat all that. I'm like, sign me up. <laughs> but see, we are not a Disney cruise. If you want to bless me with the Disney Cruise, you can bless me. <laughs> I'm not going to say no. My husband always says, no, we are a battleship. 
the battleship. We're not afraid. We're frontliners. We are. You are. And it was something, no, I'm not. Well, because by choice, you don't want to be. We are all called to be battleships. We are all called to go in the front lines. We are all called to advance the kingdom of God. We, all of us are. Not just pastors and missionaries or the mighty seven. No, 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 all of us are. All of us are. And I think it's time for us to get stronger as a body of Christ. Things are going to get worse. We always say, you know, the, it's getting darker. Yes, because darkness means, it, what it means in plain words, it just means the absence of light. That's just what darkness means. We're like, no, the world. No, 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 it's not the world. We have the light. You are the light. I am the light. So if it's getting darker in my house, like, okay, then check yourself. Right? Right? If it's getting darker in my neighborhood, then how is my light doing? How am I beaming? How am I standing strong? And that's why we can never be afraid of darkness. Because it just means it's the absence of light. And what is the absence of light? It's the absence of the kingdom. You belong to the kingdom of life. You belong to the light. You, we, we belong to Jesus. He, we are the light of the world. So it comes back to us. Right? That means that we are not to be afraid. If you would have met me before, I was the most fearful woman. I, I couldn't deal with life. I, I, I was always suicidal until, until I came to the Lord. And when I came to the Lord, I had to, that's the first thing that God delivered me from. Because at any opposition, all I wanted to do is check out. And I mean check out from earth. And if you have never experienced hopelessness, if you never experienced depression, it is awful. It is this darkness that people live in and they don't see a light. People always say, I don't see, I don't see, I, I, I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. And you won't unless you choose to be the light, unless you choose to ignite yourself. If you're suffering depression, you have the light in you. You are actually the light. Don't wait for somebody to show you the light. No, you say, I am the light of the world, and I see beyond my moment right now. And I will not live in depression. I will not, because I will not permit myself. Every day is an opportunity. The devil will come, and he's walking around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He only devours the weak. But see, you can say, well, I'm <laughs> the weak, I'm weak. God has a solution for everything. Because he says, when you're weak, hey, let me be strong in you. We have not, I mean, there, you see everything that the enemy points out, like, oh, well, you're weak, shame on you, da, da, da. No, no, no. Shame of you. No, no, no. When I'm weak, he can be strong in me. So I don't have to live depressed. I don't have to live oppressed. I don't have to let pressure pressure me down. I can pressure my pressure. How? I pressure with the word of God. You want to live a life on top of the mountain? Then be in the word of God. Talk to God. Listen to the message that I preached like two, I don't know, two Wednesdays ago. And it was about hearing heaven. Hearing God. God is constantly speaking. God wants you to live on this life with victory. We should be the most victorious people on earth. Not because we don't go to trouble. It's because we trouble our trouble. It's because we pressure our pressure. It's because we overcome no matter what. It, that doesn't mean we don't feel it. And, it. and I'm not saying deny your emotions. You can listen to, I'm, I am like... Um, uh, giving like a, a, an announcement for all my messages. Have you noticed that? <laughs> you can listen to my emoji series. I am no longer afraid of my emotions. If I want to cry, I cry. <laughs> I cry. I don't look pretty, but I cry. If I want to laugh, I laugh. I allow my emotions because they no longer dictate me. 
I don't live. They, they, they're, I'm, they're not in charge of myself, of me. They're not in charge of me any longer. I'm in charge of my emotions. I'm not only in charge of my emotions, I'm responsible for them. Nobody likes it. Can my husband be responsible, please? Wouldn't that be easy? When you misbehave, you want there someone else to take responsibility. It's because they make me do it. The devil make me do it. <laughs> I ate the taco during the fast. <laughs> he came, he knocked, and he persuaded me. I said, no, no, no. I was weak. No, you gave yourself permission. You opened your mouth and you ate it. <laughs> right? No, something came over me. Yeah, it's called the flesh. <laughs> it's called you wanting to eat what you want to eat. If God wanted me to eat a, a celery, he would have provided it. Go to the store, buy it. Do you know how many things we hear craziness? Something came over me, the devil. The devil, if you're a son of God, a daughter of God, he can't tell you. He can tell you. He can speak all day to you, but you don't have to do what he tells you any longer. Because we're not subject to him anymore. James 4, 7 says, submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from, from you. But you have to submit yourself. That's what whenever depression or sadness or whatever or disappointment tries to come in my heart, I have to say no to depression. You say no. See, all the slogans that the world has, God came out with them. Say no. Just do it. Yes, we can. <laughs> Share all the slogans and live by them and have a scripture for each one. Now, we're able to conquer. We're able to be stronger. Proverbs 24, 10 says this. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. I'm not telling you. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And I love what the NLT says. That if you fell under pressure, your strength is too small. You see, it's because I'm small. No, it's because you're choosing to be small. It's because you're choosing to think like the way that you used to think 10 years ago, you choosing to still believe that you, God hasn't delivered you. You still choose to believe that God won't, won't do this for you. You choose to believe what others are telling you, your own opinion. That's why your strength is small. If you put the word of God to practice, you will get stronger. It's not enough to, to quote the word of God. It's not enough. That's good because we should know the word of God, right? Because then if we know the word of God, then the Holy Spirit will remind us when we need the word of God and you will think about the exact word when you need it. And if you have never learned the word of God, start with that one scripture, the smallest scripture on the Bible, Jesus wept. That's the word of God. She bring life and freedom to you, knowing that your heavenly, our heavenly brother Jesus, he wept. Start with that. And then you weep, because then you put it into practice, right? How do you get stronger? To be able to, um, to be strong just in the natural, if people really want to be strong and healthy, they have to watch what they eat, and only watch what they eat, like eat healthy. But now healthy is, it's even, have you noticed that healthy is now subject to the person? It's on the eye of the beholder. Taco is healthy. The burrito is healthy. Pizza is healthy. No, not just eating healthy, eat clean. Eat clean and then work out. And then the supplements, right? So in the natural, to be healthy, we need to do all that. Then what makes us think that we don't need it for the word of God? The word of Jesus says that he's, he's, uh, he says that he didn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out, out of the mouth of God. That was his diet. 
This is, what I, this is what I do. This is what I eat. I eat the word of God every single day. He says, I don't live by bread, just that alone, but I eat by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then he put it into practice. He lived out the word. He, it, the Bible says that Jesus became the word. And you and I are little Christians, right? Christians, you know that the name Christians was, wasn't given because it was a good name. It was given as a mockery for Christians because they looked just like Jesus. They acted just like Jesus. They did miracles just like Jesus. Can you believe it? And that that's where they say, you know what? They are just like Jesus. They're like little Christ. They're Christians. It was given because they were doing miracles. They were turning the cities upside down. It's because people were being healed. It's because entire cities were being delivered. That's what they were called Christians. But now as Christians, it's like, meh. I'm a Christian. And I don't like pain. I'm a Christian, man. I'm a pacifist. (laughs) Peace. The Bible says that the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I think that is in James. It wasn't part of my um, message. But look it up. It says the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. What's the fruit of righteousness? The fruit of righteousness is when you're able to forgive people, when you're able to be kind, you're able to live in the fruit of the spirit, and you're able to give it, and you're not giving it just so people can see. No, it's sown in peace. It comes from a place that you're well inside of you. Because you can pretend that you're forgiving somebody. You can say, I forgive you, but inside I want to choke you. Okay, that seed was not sown in peace. Because we can only sow peace if you're a peacemaker. Right? Are we having fun? You know this message is a message of love, right? Luke 9.62 says, I'm going to wait for you. Let's go to Luke 9.62. And this is what it says. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Let me read it again. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Sometimes we read it, but we don't even know. This is talking about a farmer, right? Right? They needed to plow. To me, a plow means you're pioneering. You're about to get down. To this day, my daughter and I, we always laugh that we said, when when we get our first home, we're going to plant a garden. And Alexis and I, we read things about planting gardens. I went to the 99 cent store. I bought seeds. We bought every tool for gardening. But we never did it. <laughs> because every time we try, oh, but he has dirt. <laughs> ah, it's messy. We get dirty and then our nails get nasty. And we gave every reasoning why not. We would go outside. Are you ready? No, we're going to plan it. Remember, we said it. We would both encourage ourselves. We would smile. <laughs> and we would tell my husband, we're going to plant our garden. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. We'll go outside. And be like, oh, it's dirt. <laughs> Do you know how many times we did it? And we have never planted a garden, still to this day, because he has dirt. <laughs> My nails are too pretty to get like that. And so he says, whoever puts a hand to the plow, that means you're going to get dirty. It's not a comfort. You're going to be under the sun. And I don't know about you, but we don't live in times that people are plowing, right? So let's just pretend if you're going to mow your lawn, right, and you're getting your mower, And then you can't be like that because at the end, you should do it at home if it's your home. And then see how the line goes if it's straight. At the end, you probably have curves and everything. It's going to be messy because you can't move forward. You can't see what God has for us if we're constantly looking back. But we constantly look back. Jesus said, you're the light of the earth. 
You're the light of the world, the salt of the earth. He didn't tell you to become a pillar of salt. <laughs> Remember what happened to Lottie's uh, wife? You guys Lot? Do you know, have you read the story, Lot? Thank you for the three of you that has read it. <laughs> I encourage you, if you're not serving, serving children's ministry, you will learn every story there. <laughs> but let me li- give you a little story behind it. Uh, Abraham has a nephew, and he lives in this horrible place that is, people are wild and doing what they want. They're just, it says that, if you read it, actually says that uh, they were just do- living life. And they lived it how they want it. And so God says, okay, that cannot be. And then Abraham is a friend of God, so he's negotiating with God. Lord, if you have 50, would you still, you know, deliver the city? And when you read it, sometimes you read the Bible and you think, oh, God is so mean. No, he says that I wouldn't do nothing for 50 people. I, w- I, will do, I will not destroy, annihilate that entire city. It will not be burned down for 50. And then... And then Abraham goes down to even to one. And he says, and I wouldn't do it for one. So to me, as a favor, he delivered Lot. But he wasn't righteous. He didn't live for God. But yet God still delivered him. Because if he would have been the one in the city, the, the city will still stand to this day. Because he says, I wouldn't do it if there was one righteous in this city. So know that no matter what we go through in your city, in places, in Oaxaca, because you're there, the city will not be destroyed. That's the power that we have. That's the, that's the hookups that we have from heaven. You have hookups from heaven. Use them. But anyways, he, he, he delivers Lot and his family. And, he, and the only thing that he says, as you go out, um, go and I want you to go away from the city. Just don't look back. Don't look back. But Lot and Lottie, his wife, or Lolita, that's what I called her. No, just kidding. If your name is Lolita, I didn't mean it. Like, <laughs> I just saw L's, you know. I love to rhyme, I rap here and there. <laughs> so she decided to look back. And he says that she became a pillar of salt. See, you can't go to the promised land, you can't go to what God has delivered you, and you continually want to look back because you left maybe something good. But something good is not something godly. We all, even Paul says that he had to fight looking back. He had to press forward. He says, I press forward every single day not to look back. And see, if you don't want to look back, continue to look back to your past, to what happened, what someone said, and you want to be fit for the kingdom, want to be fit for the kingdom, you can't not look back. It's okay to glance for just a little bit. But looking back means doing this, like, "Mm." oh, it was nice. Oh, it was good. Have you ever seen people that are still stuck in 1980? (laughs) Or a decade they lived and they were like famous in high school. They were cheerleaders and they're still wearing their cheer now. And they're married, but they remember someone that they, oh, I remember a boyfriend that I had in the 80s. They're living in their past, and they can't even see the future and what's in front of them. They have their own families, a life to live, but they can't live the new life because they're still back living in 1980. Watch Napoleon Dynamite. If you have you back watch Napoleon Dynamite? <laughs> Napoleon's uncle, the Theo, was always in 1980. It's a great movie. It teaches you the word of God. I'm like, he almost lost his family. He was married, but he couldn't see his wife because he was living in 1980. Those are my own. You see, I sit there. I was like, I should be paid to bring the word of God in every movie that I see. (laughs) I'm just kidding. But see, sometimes we're looking back to bad things that happen. But many times we're looking back to good things that happened to you. You remember how good it was. Like if it's for a marriage, you remember how good it was when, you know, when you guys were, 
you know, dreaming together or whatever. Or when your kids were little. Do you know how parents are stuck and they still, the kids are like 40 and, oh, I remember when you were 13. And we can't enjoy where they are now because we refuse to let go of something so good. But you ca- what you have here today and the future is gooder. I make up words. <laughs> I feel that they have more pressure. <laughs> I think it's, it's time to, even if you're Christianity, if you live in your life and then you could be sitting here tonight and said, I remember when God used to speak to me. I remember when I obeyed God and this wonderful thing happened. And now look at me. Now I don't have a job. Or now my marriage is this. And now my kids are that. But I remember how good God was 10 years ago and how good I was in the word of God. And, da, da, da. and you live when how good God was in your past. But do you know that you can be awesome today? And you know that your future is amazing in Jesus. And you know that even if you miss it, the moment that you said, Jesus, forgive me, and you repent, that's the moment that he is like, awesome. Let's talk about your today, and let's talk about your tomorrow. No, Lord, but no, Lord, it was, you were so good to me in, in 2009. It's like, and I can be good to you now. I want to be good to you now. I want to show you what I have for you now. Not only what I have for you now, I want to show you what I have for your future, and it's the bomb. That's how I hear God. I hear Pastor Felicia. (laughs) Bomb.com. It's for the World Wide Web to know. But think about it. We live, we live in seasons in our life, whether good, bad, or very ugly. And God is saying, yeah, it was good, but I have something awesome for you today. I have something great for you today. And if it was, was bad, I have something good for you today. And your future is great. And you need to, if God tells us to do something, and if you read the whole entire uh, verse in Luke, which I suggest for you to read it, and he's talking about all these people that want to follow Jesus. Say, Jesus, I follow this. But they all wanted to do follow Jesus, but they all wanted their own way. They all have contingencies. I follow you, but I want, this is my negotiation. Why would you negotiate with with God? You know, whenever I think, because I'm a negotiator, I'm good at it. The Lord told me that. He told me, stop negotiating. That's why I say I'm good, because he doesn't negotiate. He doesn't change for you. He's unchangeable. He's the same one yesterday, today, and forever. He's an unchangeableness that changes me. Right? Now it's time to, it's time to fix your eyes on what's, what's your present. And don't be afraid of your present. Maybe you missed it. Maybe you're not in the best time of your life. Maybe God asked you to do something, but you haven't done it because you are just, let's call it what it is. You are disobedient. But do you know that God doesn't change his mind about you? All you have to say, Lord, forgive me. And even if you don't know how to do it, even if you're willing to come to your heavenly father and say, you know, I know you called me to do this, but I'm weak. And then allow him to be strong and then obey God. Obey God at any cost. Do you know that I am so proud? I am so proud of my husband. We always talk about it in our home and we say, he never quits. He never quits on God. We as a family have gone through so much. We have come through so much without Jesus, but we have gone through so much with Jesus, and it is better with Jesus. And you need to know that although God will let you negotiate, but why would you want to negotiate his best? Because at the end of the day, he has his best interest is in you. Whenever he's going to ask you to do something, it's because it's not his good for you is his best for you and his best is not even compared to your greatest bestest I did another word there (laughs) 
Not even compare. Do you know when I came to this church, I, when we came and we obeyed God and we came out of obedience, and, um, and I remember standing here every Wednesday and seeing a few people here sitting, and I was shaking, and you know, but I was doing it. I was doing it because I refused to be a coward. And I can say that because I'm speaking for myself. And I said, Lord, I don't care how much I shake. I don't care how much I repeat myself. I don't care if I, I make a fool out of myself. I'm going to do what you ask me to do because no matter how many excuses and reasonings I give him why he shouldn't use me, he never listened to me. So I just got tired. I said, I'm just going to do it. Get over myself. But then as I was preaching, I remember looking back. You know, when we came here, this place didn't look like that. The city didn't look like that. And the pressure was on. And I remember thinking, oh, my gosh. And I remember when I came here, someone said, that person is not here any longer, bless her heart, but she, I'm sure she's in a good place. But she said, I don't like your name. I was like, hmm. And she gave me a new name. I introduced myself. I said, I'm Virginia. And this person said, I don't like your name. I think your name is pesado. That's what she said. It means heavy, like. I was like, praise Jesus. <laughs> heavy lifter here. <laughs> but then you're trying to rub it off like, oh, you don't care. No, but you do care. You do care. I'm not going to lie. It, it, it hurts. She said, I not only like your name, I'm going to call you Victoria. And she said, after that, she said, I'm going to call you Victoria, and I'm not going to call you pastor. Said, I don't care. You, you don't have to call me pastor, but you have to call me by my name. I do have a name, right? So I was like, you don't have to call me pastor, but I am Virginia. She's like, no, you're Victoria. And I was like, oh. I was very strong, and then I was like, ah, crying. And then I will, I will look back. I had the hand on my plow. This is what God has called us to do. We're here to do this church. And yes, but, and then I will look back, and I will remember the good times from where I came from, where I gave my life to Jesus, that people loved me there. I was loved and beloved. <laughs> and I will look back, and I will continue to look to the good times. And I told the Lord, I can't. I, I felt like my heart was split in two. Like, oh, I know I'm doing the will of God, but I, oh, I remember the, you know, the, the milk and honey over there. But you know what I told the Lord one time? I said, Lord, I submit myself to you because I don't believe that if I'm going to obey you, that I'm going to feel like this the rest of my life. I want to be fully in love with what you have called me to do. No matter what people say, no matter people change me, my name, not me, but my name. I might have they call me Lolita, I'm okay. <laughs> and I remember God dealing with my heart. And I never forget that one time, on a Wednesday night, I was preaching here. And then I looked at the few people, and my heart was undone and broken. And I was like, oh, I love them. I love them. Like, they didn't love me, but I love them them and I was like oh, I love the people and then I was like um, when I finished preaching I went outside and there was still no trees I got out I had requested the Lord for one tree in this in this street there was still no trees but I can I was able to see a tree when the tree wasn't there and I heard birds at night on a Wednesday night I mean this is me hearing by the faith and I said, yeah, I love it. And I was like, and I love this city. And I, I love New Hall. And I wanted to be like, it's a wonderful life. I wanted to say, I love you, New Hall, and run. And, ah, and this one, I love you, New Hall. <laughs> and that's how I felt inside. And you know when I finished doing that and doing my dance in my mind, people, I wouldn't do it. My husband probably would be embarrassed, but he's not here. He's like, ah, love you. <laughs> the Lord said, May I remind you that this is my best for you? And I wept. Sometimes the best of God doesn't look like your best. 
But once you know that this is what God had called me to do, this is what I have, have been born to do, you're going to love his best. You're going to love your life no matter what you go through. And to this day, I can honestly tell you that I wouldn't change it for a thing. I wouldn't change it. People can come and go back and do, no, I would never change it. I am in love with what God had asked me to do. That doesn't mean it's not hard. But I have learned to love his best. And whenever things get hard, I close my eyes and I said, this is your best. And why wouldn't I love your best? You have to love the best of God for you. And you have to press when you're living his best. Many times it doesn't think, and it, I mean, not doesn't think, but it doesn't look like you thought it was going to look. You thought it was going to come in a pink envelope with fairy dust. Instead, it's dirt and gloves, and you need to plow. You need to get fit. I might not be fit physically, but I believe that I'm working my way to be physically fit for the kingdom of heaven so that his kingdom can move forward. So let me close with this. God wants you to be fit. He wants you to be fit in the spirit. He wants you to be fit for the kingdom so he can use you. He wants you to love his best. And with God, you never trade down. Ever, ever, ever trade down. So never be afraid of trading your life for his life, for your best with his best. is the best of the bestest. If today's message impacted you in any way and you would like to help us spread the gospel to others by giving a financial gift, please text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed as yours was today.